human brain. It serves as a complex roadmap of the world we experience. It gives directions to our thoughts and perceptions so we arrive at our destination safely and efficiently. But people with neurological brain disorders like schizophrenia or manic depression have been given a map with roads that don't meet where they should, bridges that are missing, and routes that lead to nowhere. If you met a fellow traveler misguided by his map, would you judge him and leave him stranded, or would you get out your map and help him find his way? You ain't the stigma. Get it? Get it, Joe. <laughs> yeah. You ain't the stigma. Hi there, I'm Joe Tyler. Are you stressed out, wigged out, freaked out, feeling anxious, angry, or depressed? Want to know how people with real mental health problems are in a cope? Keep it right here and get the latest word from experts in the field like me, Joseph Tyler, a consumer services assistant at the Deany Townsend Hospital, a speaker for the cause for mental health, as well as a NAMI of Nevada executive director. Here on Narration the Stigma, we take you, the viewer, into the brain. We got the old noggin right here, Mike the old brain's biochemistry, that is, mental illness, and back to reality safely. Here in Race in the Stigma, we find hope for people whose lives have become unmanageable. So stay with us for the next half an hour as we erase the stigma for people with brain disorders. The name of the show today is The Bigger, Bigger Picture. We did a show with Dr. Harold Cook back almost a year ago, I guess, who, uh, who talked about how the, the big picture was the big picture. Now we got his boss, really, Mike Weldon. And I'm going to introduce Mike with kind of a formal introduction, which I hope he won't get too stiff about. But Mike <laughs> Weldon has served as director, director of the Department of Human Resources since 2002, 2001, July 2001, which I came on board with the, with the Dean, well, not with the Dean Townsend Hospital, with the state of Nevada in, 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 in June, February of 2000. And one. So he was first appointed by Governor Kenny Gwynn and then reappointed by Jim Gibbons. He is responsible for oversight of the largest department, he's a humble guy, but the lar largest department of the state of Nevada government, approximately 5,200 employees, 29% of the budget. The division of, within D DHS includes aging services, child and family services, health care financing policy, which is a big chunk of that, I think, and then mental health and developmental services, which I work in, and then welfare and supportive, welfare and supportive services, and the Office of Public Defender, and major programs within the Director's Office include the Senior and Disability Rx, and the Office of Aging and Disability Services, and the Office of Suicide Prevention, which we'll talk about today as well as a grants management unit. Now, Mike, prior to his appointment as director, was state welfare as a welfare administrator, worked in the agency in different capacities for over 25 years. His, he's beginning his career as a case worker, actually. Mm -hmm. So why don't you, I mean, if you feel comfortable, you could take us back to some of, those, some of that stuff you did many, many years ago, because some of that stuff still helps you today as a, to give you a founding for, for the stuff that really matters to you, I think. Yeah, well, first, Joe, thanks for having me on here. It's an honor to be here. And, you know, going back, uh, yes, I have been at the state almost uh, going on 35 years now. And uh, my, my bio says that I started as a case manager. I actually started with the state as a lawnmower boy. Oh, wow. Uh, right out of high school, I went to work for a youth correction facility in Caliente, Nevada. That's where I'm born and raised. Uh, and when I was going to college, I came back in the summers and mowed lawns at a correctional institution and supervised uh, uh, the uh, youth that were in that institution. And after I graduated from college, uh, uh, I signed on with the welfare division as a caseworker. And uh, frankly, I've never uh, sought employment elsewhere. I've been within Health and Human Services my entire career. Started uh, part-time in 72, full-time in 76. Okay. 72, golly, Mike, you're a little bit older than I, than I am, because that was like, not too much, but, but somewhat, because I can't think of where I was in 72. Jeez, I was, uh, 
I think I was in, I was getting out of high school, just about 72. Seven, I graduated in 71, so so that's what, well, that's about when you did yep, too. So yep. we're pretty much pretty same much same age, probably age. Joe. Okay, all right. So um, and he's a native Nevadan. Yep, born and raised in Caliente, Nevada. Caliente, Nevada. Small town. I thought I thought when I when I thought that you were raised in that you were born in. Uh, in Gardnerville and Minden, but do you live in Gardnerville and Minden now? Yeah, I live in the Minden area now, uh, born and raised in Caliani, lived in Vegas for a few years when I started my career and moved up north and I've been up north uh, since 79. Uh, okay. And you got your business administration degree from Southern Utah? Yep. In, uh, Southern Utah University. Yeah, a lot of people wonder what a business guy's doing in social services, but uh, Went to work. Uh, well, you 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 have a degree in in social services before business, though, right? No, I no? have no background oh. in social services. Oh wow! My uh, college training is in business, economics, and finance. Okay, okay. I was at one time a licensed social worker, okay. but I was not a degreed social worker. And and I studied. Interesting. We have a little bit of time to talk on this show. I. I studied health and economics in my master's degree in public health administration and planning. And we learned in health economics, the one thing that would take, take, home, take home message was that of, uh, upwards of 18 percent of, of the gross national product for the nation is health care. So we knew we were in the right field, right? Yeah. I and mean, obviously, it takes a lot of money to finance. Health and Human it Services. It might be more than that now. I don't know. You probably know that. Well, as you now. indicated in the lead-in, Health and Human Services in the Nevada budget is about 29 percent, or mm -hmm. I like to roughly say about one-third of uh, the entire state budget is Health and Human Services. So, in our, you know, in our, in our business, it's right now. If you take a two-year period, we're budgeted on a two-year cycle. The entire budget's about 5.7 billion. That's a billion, not a million, billion. And it's about $2 million worth of general fund. So when you put that on a pie chart, uh, we're about 30% of the state's budget. And 2.7 billion. No, 5.7 5 .7 billion. Oh, that's total spending. I thought that the total budget was nine billion. Is no, well, you, people get confused by what the budget is. Okay. When you talk about state general fund dollars, it's right around seven billion dollars. Okay. And so the health and human services share of that seven billion is about two billion. But okay. then remember that when we get state dollars, we're able to match those with federal dollars in many cases, yeah. particularly in the Medicaid program. And that's what goes. And some yeah. of those uh, child welfare programs and things like that. Uh -huh. And so when we match it with the federal dollars, our entire budget grows from the $2 billion of state money to $5.7 billion of uh, entire spending okay. over a two-year period. Okay. And, the, and the biggest... Uh, uh, share of our pie goes to the uh, Medicaid program, which is about 56 to 58 percent of, you know, again, if you make a pie chart on where health and human services money goes, it mostly goes to health care Medicaid. Medicaid, yeah. Cause, and then cause mental health and developmental services gets about 13 percent. 13 percent. Of the, our entire budget. Yeah, yeah. And so, well, I guess my first question, which we're going to try and get some specificity here, I think, um, is that um, um, we've got, um, as I said, you have oversight of MHDS and, as well as Medicaid. Right. Um, are we at the Deany Townsend Hospital treat our inpatients whose care falls mostly under MHDS because they're mostly indigents, at least when they start out, many are indigents, and so it's MHDS entirely. And then they when they're discharged, they may fall under Medicaid. And so we're hoping that we can maintain continuity of care for those people who don't have a fail first on their meds, which I know you, you get involved with to some degree, fail first methodology with their medications, which may or may not be generic so that when they go from MHDS to Medicaid, that they can maintain their same medications and have some continuity. And I know, I, I, I know Chuck Duart, I work on the DUR board, and the, and the, and the um, what's the name of the other one? The, the Pharmacy the and Therapeutics, Pharmacy Therapeutics Committee. Committee. And now we're having some of that fail first stuff. And um, 
What, what's your opinion, or how, how can we get around that? Or what, Well, what? let me give you a little bit of information. Okay. Uh, you know, first, I, I think let's talk on the mental health uh, side of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, Nevada's mental health system has used what we call a medication algorithm. Some people call it a T-map. Uh, but it's basically a formulary that our doctors use to uh, prescribe medications. And, and, and we certainly uh, believe or subscribe to a philosophy that we want the patients to get the medications that work for them. Mm -hmm. But we also have a, a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, we got to watch the budget, uh, bottom line. And so we also want to not use any more expensive of medications than we have to. So we use these algorithms to try to encourage that we prescribe effective medication, but th that we get the best bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. In the Medicaid program, uh, since 2003, uh, we have been prohibited uh, by state statute uh, from uh, uh, using what we call a preferred drug list, an algorithm, uh, or you use the term fail first. I don't like that because I don't think that's what we're we're trying to do. Yeah. It, to save some money during these last uh, few years of economic difficulty, we asked the legislature to give us permission to implement a preferred drug list for antipsychotic medications. And so they approved that in the special session that uh, we just left uh, a few weeks ago. And so what's happening in Medicaid is that we will work through the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee that they run mm -hmm. and we will be establishing a preferred drug list. And so there is a potential for some conflict between what the Medicaid uh, preferred drug list will look like and what the mental health psychiatrists may be using, what patients are receiving. But we put safeguards or we're putting safeguards in place that if someone comes, if you will, from the community to uh, Deany Townsend or any other institution, they may have their medications changed, uh, titrated up or down, uh, or a change, total change in medications. Well, Medicaid policy allows for when someone comes back to the community that if they're on a drug that's not on the preferred drug list, mm -hmm. then physicians, psychiatrists can call and get what we call a prior authorization. Mm -hmm. And so that they don't have to bounce between medications. So mm -hmm. someone who's on a medication that's working for them, there is a process in place that physicians can call get a prior authorization, and so a patient can stay on the medication that is helping How them. difficult is that prior authorization? for? Do you, you know, we you were asked... Do you know the... the, the I, I do know that. We were asked questions okay, about, asked that, questions about we, uh, that during the legislative session. That's a pretty important kind of thing, because my understanding is that two doctors have to sign... No. No? No? A doctor has to call up and provide the medical reason why they want to get a, a drug authorized okay. and we were criticized during the legislative session that that process takes a long time mm -hmm. by federal law we have to respond in 24 hours wow. we tested our system we looked at our statistics over the last year mm -hmm. the average length of time it takes for a physician if they call our call center takes about three and a half minutes to get a prior authorization hmm. So it really is not a breakdown okay. in the system. Now, some physicians mail stuff or use a fax machine. That's a little longer in time. But if a physician calls, has the Medicaid uh, information that they need, in other words, you know, there might be an allergy issue or uh, the, the medication hasn't worked uh, previously, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of things, whatever the physician thinks is the medical reason, they can get it prior authorized fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we don't see that that's going to be a big issue. That doesn't sound like it then, does it? We're going to closely monitor it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is a problem, mm -hmm. then uh, I've committed to the legislature, as has Chuck Duart, that if it's a problem, then uh, the bill or the language now sunsets uh, June 30, 2011. If it's problematic, if patients are not able to get the, the medications they need, if we're not saving money, if it's a hassle, then we'll let the program expire. Uh, but uh, right now, with the economy the way it is, I know. we need to save every dime we can. And this, uh, you know, this legislation that passed uh, is projected to save us about eight hundred thousand dollars a year. And so, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but we are looking everywhere we can for savings yeah. while trying not to harm anybody mm -hmm. in those policies that we th that we change. Because I know um, <coughs> one of the guys who uh, who I'm familiar with. 
um, has had his, of course, this is Medicare stuff, which is federal dollars. Yeah, right? totally different than totally what we different. administer. So he has his senior dimensions, and, and we're thinking it's monopoly, not monopoly of, of insurance companies that are causing his co-payments to go sky high because he was getting a brand name drug and now he's getting now he's getting a co-payment of eighty five dollars a month and for two people it's on the same med that that's pretty prohibitive you know? yeah you know and one good thing you know this joe that a lot of the medications particularly in the antipsychotics a lot of them have been going off what we call you know brand name or what we call patented drugs and they're moving to generic so we've seen a lot of the medications that we use routinely in uh, you know mental health care mm -hmm. going from brand name to generic and that's actually saved our pharmacy uh, program a ton of money mm -hmm. over the last and couple that's, of years. I did want to ask you about that because dipping into back into the cost <coughs> of atypicals which atypicals are those medications that are mostly the most expensive kinds of medications especially when they're brand name. Mm -hmm. I know some of those ones can run 500 a month some of them right. for the atypical that are brand names. But um, um, I'm on generic risperidone, which is now gone generic. Do you know? And that went generic two years ago. Do you know how much that saved? Or I, I, I can't tell you specifically I, yeah, on I, per I drug, but I can give you yeah. some general information, Joe. Um, again, we've been working pretty diligently over the last couple of years to uh, try to work on what we call our algorithms or our, our you know, our policies that the physicians follow. The second issue we've been working a lot on is inventory control, making sure that we are being as tight as we can on our inventory on our medication. And then because so many drugs have gone generics over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then a fourth issue is we're doing a lot better job as a state getting people connected to the Medicaid program. And therefore, instead of paying the entire costs of medications out of the mental health budget, then we're getting uh, some of the costs paid for are the Medicaid budget, and that's either paid half by the federal government and, and half saves, by the state. That, that saves, saves us money. Because the federal government pays 50 percent. Yes, of the, that's correct. And over the last so. two years, mm -hmm. uh, we have actually been able to reduce or pull money out of the mental health medication budget hmm. about $35 million. Wow. So wow. that's a significant okay. uh, 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 chunk of change. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, and again, I think it's it's a combination of things. It's better better management. It's better inventory control. It's uh, more more drugs going in generics and becoming less costly and leveraging the Medicaid dollars. And you know that that gives me a good feeling that the pharmacy and therapeutics committee that I I, I kind of advise on because I'm just in an advisory capacity, right. not in a voting capacity. Correct. But but it's good that because they're they're the ones that kind of were the forefront of doing some of that stuff. That's now. correct. Good. And you know, and, and, and pharmacy spend uh, is is very costly. Medicaid alone, uh, oh, we spend yeah. about a hundred million dollars a year on pharmacy, and mm -hmm. so everywhere we can again be as effective as we can and be as economical as we can. That's that's our goal. Okay. And again, uh, try you know we do not want to do harm to patients. Right. And so right. I, I I you know every once in a while I'll get an email or a phone call that you know, someone's been harmed and usually when we go through it, we can get that fixed uh, pretty quick. So we do not want to do harm to patients. We want them to get the medications that work. Okay. And that's, what else can you ask for? That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's services number one. That right. goes back to your case management, case, exactly. case, case stuff. Let's get, let's get the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, bird in the world here. He, you know, he's a big green wing. We're going to do a little halftime entertainment. Let's see whether he can do it. Come on, Big Bird. Wait a minute. Let's see. I'll give him a shot. He's going to probably do his thing here, but let's see. I brought him some nuts because he performs better with nuts. Do you see those nuts, Big Bird? Big Eagle. Big Eagle. Big Eagle. <coughs> do you hear him say that? <laughs> He's a Big Bird. He turns on pretty good, too. He knows this is his time to shine. Big Eagle. Big Eagle. <coughs> good. Okay. Now watch this, <laughs> Mike, watch this. Obedient one. Obedient one. I'm here. Can you hear that? That's a macaw talking. Yeah. That's a macaw talking. He knows his part. He knows his part. I'm Ob here. Good. Good, Big Bird. Okay, now for your trip to Hawaii, you've been to Hawaii, I know. But twice. Twice. I've only been twice, too. 
Can't sing. afford to go there more often than All that. Right. Sing the mushy sing. What is in the what? I guess Florida is a sunshine state. Yeah. He says you are my sunshine. That was pretty clear. Did you hear him say that? I heard it. That's that's better singer you, than I am, you Joe. Guess that song. Better singer than I am. Sing the mushy sing. Sing the bird sing. Sing. That wasn't as good. Okay. Okay. And then he's gonna do. Um, let's see. What's this next one? Um, did you know there's a big hummingbird? Did you know there's a big hummingbird? Hummingbird? Hummer? Are you a hummer? Did you know there's a big hummingbird? Oh, he ain't gonna do it much more. So let's try him. What else we got, big bird? Okay. When I retire from state government, I'm going to do. When I retire from state government, I'm going to do. Rest. rest. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see what we can get him up here. Okay. Now. If the, if the President of the United States were here, what would you do? Barack Obama was elected President of the United States. If the President were here, what would you do? <coughs> salute. You should salute a little better there. It's a left wing salute, but we go with it anyway. Cause <laughs> if Barack Obama were you do? <coughs> salute. Okay, and Mike's pretty humble, but we'll get him to salute. Mike Weldon is here. What do you do? <coughs> salute. Oh, that was a good salute. Yeah, that was a great one. <laughs> okay. All right. See, what are the kinds of things, Big Bird? Let's see what we can get him to. Let's get him a little swinger here. This is all halftime entertainment, so I don't know what we got on the well, camera. I only know one song, so you'll have to teach him to <laughs> sing Windy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not stormy, but windy, huh? Windy. Windy. By the association. Okay. I had to memorize it in high school, so uh, it's the only one I really memorized. Okay. Okay. Not the finger, doggone it, you big dummy. He bet me pretty good there. Pretty That's smart right. bird there, Joe. He's a smart bird. He's a smart bird. Okay, big bird. Is that good? Okay, let's move right along after my finger heals. <laughs> oh, you dummy. Why'd you bite me so hard? Okay. The next, next question is our most vulnerable. Um, the housing, the housing for the disabled population. Um, now, um, what do you see getting getting a look at the bigger picture from the relief relief from HUD um, and MHM, MHDS? Because MHDS picks up. I don't. You know, probably know those figures for what MHDS housing figures are. Um, and then I know what. Do you know what the percentage is for? For, of course, disabled populations are differing. I don't know, that could be kind of a tough one for you to... Yeah, I don't know the exact eligibility criteria on that, Joe, but I, I guess what I, I can tell you is that, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, and maybe not everybody else's, but, you know, medication, having stable medication and having a good medication budget, uh, number one in our business, closely followed by housing. Those two elements, if you got a place to live, live and get and, stable, and, and medication, stable medication, that's what, we, you can do, you that's can what do. we try to work on. And if you look at the budget cuts that we've been doing, we've been trying to protect as many housing dollars as we could. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, if you look at the mental health budget, we did take a little reduction in our residential services in southern Nevada. Yes. We took a reduction of about uh, $2.7 million. But and I saw you speak on that because uh, you were on the, on the, on the, on the um, assembly floor, when you when you spoke on that, and Sheila Leslie was there, I think, and right, and I saw that I saw that that come come to pass. Right. So what we what we did is we took a look at the budget and looked at what we were doing with our waiting lists and caseloads and things like that, and so we didn't really remove any residential dollars on that on the. Uh, on the mental health side of mental health and developmental services. Mm -hmm. you know, we looked at where we had waiting lists and things like that. We did lose, lose like I said, about $2.7 million in the South, but that's because we had zero people on the waiting list. We left enough money in there that we could continue to support everybody that's currently getting residential support, plus add about 85 more slots. Mm -hmm. uh, over the next uh, 15 months till the end of the, uh, the biennium. Now, you know, that's gonna be, uh, you know, that's going to be a big issue when we get to the 21 legislature, uh, 
the 2011 legislature, I should say. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to uh, figure out uh, how we're going to address any more growth uh, that we need. Um, mm -hmm. But what we've been trying to do is not pull anybody out of residential support, the services, mm -hmm. and try to leave some reasonable growth in the budget. But we, 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 we gave up some of the growth that... Uh, we had originally had budgeted, like and, I said, about 2.7 million. And we million. knew that that may come to be tough because, <coughs> as as Senator Sheila Leslie said, there on the floor, she said, "We're trying to keep people out of the ERs, and one of the ways right. to do that is to give them housing and give them medications, and those two factors, to because because if they get backed up in the emergency rooms again, that's a big problem for for mental health." Right. You know? so yeah, we originally had that as one of the cuts. We went over when we started looking at some of the ad bats add backs that we could possibly get. Mm -hmm. The governor added back, uh, you know, uh, about a million and a half dollars into the residential. And so we, we think we're in pretty good shape being able to continue through with, you know, the addressing some of the wait lists and the demand for residential services on the mental health side of the budget. So, okay. you know, I, 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 with this economy the way it is, you just don't know. So many people, you know, uh, you know, the foreclosure business and unemployment and not being able to it's, meet it's, your rents. It's hard for me to work in, in mental health at the at the observation unit and see people go out without really any place to go. You know, right. you just kind of let them let them go out and, and you don't know where they're going to go. It's, it's 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 a tough it's a tough thing. Yeah, I saw some statistics. I was looking at the Southern Nevada observation unit statistics uh, mm -hmm. earlier this week with Dr. Cook in some meetings down south, and I was surprised that it was. Uh, yeah, was it seemed like about a quarter of the people that came yeah. in there did not have stable housing while, when they were leaving, and so it's mm -hmm. a significant issue. That's a tough one. And we'll have to continue to and, work and on that in the next legislature. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, so, but the, but the answer comes potentially from, and I know you're not the tax man. I wrote that in your question. I know you're not the tax man, but, but I talked with Bob Coffin, who, who is the tax man? Senator Coffin, now he's leaving the legislature, I think, but, but Senator Coffin was very important towards getting us some, some of those dollars from, from say, mining and, and, um, and some of the tourism and gaming, the, the, the resort association industry came, came up with some money. But we can't look forward to gaming. Is, is there anything we can, do you see that I should advocate for as a NAMI advocate? That the, the would help us to, to build our our because Ross Reynolds says there are fees and not taxes in the United, in, in Nevada because they're mostly fees as opposed to taxes because we don't have an income tax. She says maybe we should work toward an income tax. Maybe she didn't say that, but she was leading us down that road. What well, do, first do thing, think? Joe, you're right. I'm not the tax man. I don't, no, no, I, I don't get man. to work in the uh, the committees that work on the revenue side. I mostly try to manage the expenditure side. But yeah. I, I think. Going forward, it's going to be a balance of things. I mean, I think we're going to, going to continue to have to tighten our belt on expenditures, again, making sure we're targeting the dollars to where they're most needed. And, and for revenue going forward, about the only thing I can really suggest in that area is we do need to have a stable tax yeah. uh, source, whatever it is. And because, we've been through a whole bunch of up and downs. Resort associations, the, the gaming industry <clears throat> is, is having a tough time. I know they are, you know. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm a little bit worried because, I mean, we hear numbers that the revenues may be short as much as $2 billion or mm -hmm. $3 billion. That's dollars. what, what Roz was talking about. And Those people are talking, working. you know, that it could be a 30 to 50% mm -hmm. gap. Uh, so, you know, uh, a lot of smart people are going to have to get in a room over the next uh, uh year and a half before the next legislative session uh, signee dies and figure out some stable source of revenue but again I think that has to be coupled with uh, some additional uh, if you will tightening of the purse streams on the expenditure side. Well and that's what that's what we're working on. So. I think you're gonna have okay. to move from both ends. Both ends. Both come, to, come but, together yep. at both ends. And it's not gonna be as like it was. The economy Nevada's economy is not, not picking up. Not picking up. Yeah. Not yet. We're the last ones to pick up because we're a tourism state. Right. New unemployment numbers were higher than ever. Um, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for your time. And, uh, um, and I hope you'll come. I'm going to make you a public invitation to come to our May walk, walking park. I'll do that. Where's it at? It's at Idlewild Park on May 8th. And, um, 
We're going to have Eldorados providing box lunches and um, 